Hey everyone, this is Martin again, and hope all of you are doing well. As you can see by the title of the video, this is going to be a discussion on my personal journey with Lyme disease and how it has affected um, those nearest and dearest to me in terms of, you know, just financial and emotional strain and just sort of like the burden that people take on whenever they have to um, deal with someone who they love that, that has, you know, a chronic condition. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So I definitely feel that there are certain things that are not talked about enough when it comes to Lyme disease and really any chronic condition, especially those really confusing ones um, like Lyme disease, um, especially with the fact that so much of Lyme disease cannot be measured in fact, a lot of the, the testing itself is very faulty. So a lot of the times you don't even, you'll have Lyme disease and there is no definitive way of, of taking a test that can confirm that. And many people go years and even decades of their lives without even really knowing. And, you know, for me, I've, I've had Lyme disease now since about 2015, but it didn't really wreck my entire life until 2019 so you know we're already in august of 2020 and i've definitely had a lot of time to sort of go over and decompress all of the emotional baggage all of the the just the feelings that go in with it and the amount of the just the heavy workload and just the heavy load general that those around me have had to pick up for me and how that's affected me and how that's affected them, how that's affected our relationships. And it is what it is, you know. Whenever I, I first got my Lyme disease in 2019, I um, went into this in great length in my, in my initial video. Um, I'll leave the description in the, the little box below. But, you know, I was with my partner at the time and I got this, these, these like just this onslaught of confusing, um, symptoms and I, and I had all of these symptoms that I, I could not figure out what was going on with me and as a result it placed a lot of strain on him I was not able to work I was not able to really do anything and just the the you know just the resentment the, the, the resentment and all of the additional baggage that we were going through as a couple at the time it was it was it was very very tough and so moving along you know we split up for, you know, many different reasons. Lyme disease wasn't so much one of those, but you know, of course it adds to the, the load, you know what I mean? And after that happened, I was sort of stuck in New York and I pretty much had to just fend for myself and, and just make do with whatever I had. And for a few months, it was working very well. And I was able to, you know, I was, I was able to support myself enough to where, you know, I could, I could bear the day. Um, with each month, it got a little bit more and more challenging and ultimately it just, it spiraled, you know what I mean? Especially when I started my, my medications. And so moving along and, you know, my time moving back to Florida and it's just been, it's been a shit show, you know what I mean? For lack of a better term and my communication and my relationship with my parents is especially strained. You know, for them, I left home when I was really, really young. I left home when I was 18. I left home when I was 18. I moved back when I was probably like 23. But then I left again, you know, a couple years later and, and I'm, you know, I, I've been gone for years. And so for them, they sort of see me as like this, you know, self-sufficient, independent, yada, yada, yada. And for the most part I am, or I have been. And so whenever I first told my mother about, you know, the fact that I had this, this disease, she was just all like, oh, okay, well, you need to just take your medications and da da da, and, and you'll be all great to go and this and that, you know, which is the sentiment that many people have. Many people think, um, just like with any other disease, all you need to do is just take a shot, take a pill, wait a couple of weeks, you'll be good, that's it. But having to explain to someone who doesn't, who doesn't understand the concept of a chronic disease, something that is going to flare up as you live your entire life. I'm gonna to have to live my entire life with this, this condition. 
And my mother in particular, in particular has been incredibly, just, she has no compassion. Um, and exactly what I feared, what, what, what it, exactly what I feared would happen coming from New York back to Miami and having to be down here is the simple fact that I knew that it, it was going to come up, you know, the whole thing like, you know, I can't work, I'm tired or uh, I'm exhausted all the time. You know, I have brain fog, I have this, I have that. And she sees me and she's like, well, you're talking, you're walking. So I don't understand, you know, for her, it's like, well, you need to be inside of a bed. You need to, if, if you are as sick as, as you say you are, then you should be, you know, hooked up to some IV and, and basically looking like a cancer patient and having to explain over and over and over and over again, it's just become just, just, it's gut wrenching to me because of the simple fact that she just cannot look at me. And, and essentially what it is, is that she just doesn't believe me. She doesn't believe me and she thinks that I'm in many ways making it up. I'm being lazy, I'm being this, I'm being that. And the stigma of having a chronic disease, like Lyme disease, is the fact that people label you as such. People see you as just like these, like, oh, like you're just making it up. Even doctors think that. So it's like, Whenever she sees me and I'm walking and I'm talking, she's like, well, if you could walk, if you could talk, then you could work. You know what I mean? And as a result, you know, she's, she's told me, she's like, I'm not gonna give you any more money. And it's, it's, been, it's been hard. It's been hard having to just sort of scrounge for whatever I can find. Simultaneously, we're going through this pandemic right now and everyone is stretched financially, you know what I mean? So it's like, as much as I want to hate her, as much as I want to, to be just automatically upset, which I am, I have to use like my higher consciousness and I have to really, really just think like, look, finances for everyone is, is stretched and they're no different. And so for me, when they see me and they're just like, I don't think you're sick. I have to understand that there are many factors that go into into that those decisions, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to give you any more money if I don't think you're sick. The part that hurts the most is just the simple fact that she can't just look at me and, and just believe me. Like, I've had all this all this paperwork, I've had all these tests done, I've had, I've been in the hospital, like, like there are days when she's seen me where I have not been able to walk. I remember a, a, a time when recently we went to the grocery store. She took me to the grocery store. And at, at one point I was just, um, I had to stop. I had to stop and I had to just like catch, not catch my breath, but like I was having such bad fatigue and brain fog that I just stopped in my tracks. And instead of just being like, oh, you know, you know, just like maternal and just like, baby, like, you know, what's wrong with you? Da, da, da. She just told me straight up, she's like, Mario, don't make a scene. Don't make a scene here. Don't make a scene. You know what I mean? Like, like completely disregarding me, completely dismissing me. And it's a terrible feeling. It's, it's exhausting. It's, it's hurtful. It's degrading. And the fact that I've already had doctors that have had this sort of stance where like, we can't find anything wrong with you. I don't know. You're just making it up. I don't know. Like you have a really vivid imagination. You know, get a life. Like, all of these things are not what's being said, but these things, like, it feels that way. It feels like that. And so, cut to today, she, I was, I was at my cousin's house, and he was working on his car. I was, I was in his bed, and he had the door open. So I was just sort of, like, laying in bed, like, on my phone, you know. And my mother is she works for the post office she's a mail lady so she actually delivers mail on that route at his house so she pulls up and she sees him outside you know so that's her nephew she jumps out and you know like she's just like hey how have you been you know just catching up this and that mind you i can hear everything the door is wide open i can hear her like literally she was probably 20 feet away she did not know i was there she did not know she could not see me 
One of the first things that come out of her mouth is like, oh my God, this thing with Martin is just stressing me out. You know, the fact that, you know, I see him walking all the time. I've seen, I've seen him walk, you know, I've seen him walk to the park and this and that. So if he can walk, why can't he work? And he's always asking for money and this, that, and the third. And you know, I think, I think he's exaggerating certain things. You know what I mean? And in that moment, I can hear her. And I know my cousin, I know my cousin was probably a little bit mortified as well. But I, I heard all of those things. And with each passing second, I could feel myself growing more and more just furious. Furious, but at the same time, just hurt. And I wanted to just get up right then and there and go outside and just, I guess, confront her and just, and just scream at her and tell her to get the fuck away and this, that, and the third. And, and I knew if I would have done that, first and foremost, it would have, it would have been hilarious because she wouldn't have been expecting that and she would have looked really stupid. But I, more so, I just feel that it wouldn't have done anything. You know what I mean? Being older now, you know, I'm, I'm in my 30s now, so it's like, what I've learned is that you really need to mind the energy that you give out. That's with everything. Mind the energy that you give out. And there is no point in arguing with someone when they're like a total brick wall. There is nothing that I can tell her that would make her feel any different. Nothing. If she were to see me like hooked up to some hospital bed or something like that, then maybe, you know, that might change her perception. But the thing about it is that, like I said, I've been gone all of these years. So she does not see me every day in and out. What she sees is when I go and I see her on my good days. People who have Lyme disease, Lyme disease and other co-infections and chronic diseases and all this stuff, you know that you have good days and you have, you have really bad days. So it's like on your good days, you appear normal. You appear, you're talking, you're, 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 on the surface, you look fine. And so people judge that. They're like, well, how can you be sick if, if today you went bowling with us? How can you be sick? The little do they know, I went bowling with y'all on Monday, but the little beer that I had on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I was in bed, recovering, exhausted, fatigued, sick, brain fog, you know, extreme stomach pains, like the list goes on and on. They don't see me on those days. They see me when they see me on my good days. And so, you know, that, that happened today. That happened today with the whole, my mother fiasco, whatever. And like I said, I wanted to get up. I wanted to go over there. I wanted to scream. I wanted to, I wanted to, to you know, I, 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 re, I internally, I felt it and I wanted to react. But being who I am today, I know that that wouldn't have made any sort of difference. And it would have just made an ass out of all of us because if there were neighbors outside, it just would have been a scene. And that's not what I'm about. You know what I mean? And growing up, my mother and I, we did have a contentious relationship to begin with, but we've made, we've made amends so many times growing up. You know what I mean? Like my mother was, was very, very strict growing up and she was very strict and she was very obnoxious. And I was just, and I still am, incredibly willful. And so it's like, when you have a parent who wanted to control everything you did, and you have a child who just doesn't obey, that causes issues. And so that's part of the reason why I had to leave when I was so young. So, my relationship with my mother is strained. She thinks that I'm lying. She thinks that I just want to hit her up for money. She thinks that I just don't want to work. She thinks that I'm... I'm just pretty much just a piece of shit in so many words. And knowing that that's my mother that thinks that is just one of the most disheartening, just gut-wrenching things to really digest. And so it is what it is. Going from her to my father, which is interesting because my father my father and I growing up, we never really had much of a relationship either. You know what I mean? Again, I was, I was a, I wasn't so much a bad kid in the sense that I would get in trouble, you know, at school, you know what I mean? 
I, or, or like with the law or anything like that. No, I was just more a bad kid when it came to my parents. So my relationship with them has always been touchy for the most part. You know what I mean? Like I said, my mother and I, we've made, we've made peace and we've been great for like the last 10 years. It's a long time. The last 10 years we've been great. And my father and I, we never really had much of a relationship um, for many reasons. But one of the things that I've, I've really realized in this process is that my father growing up was always just very, very, you know, masculine, macho, doesn't want to show any sort of emotion. You know, he, you know, Latin men are very much like that. And so he, he, he's just, he's always been a wall and he was really, really like, abusive and, and vindictive growing up and so from a very young age I just learned just to like leave it alone with him and to just remove myself from any sort of negativity when it came to him so over the years like I said I've been gone all of these years so like every time that we do see every time that we do see each other um, over the years it has progressively gotten better and so like I said sort of the bad blood and the resentment that I had with my parents growing up it's, it's subsided, you know what I mean, immensely from, the, from when I was a teenager to now. You know, I'm 31 years old, so it's like we've had so many years to unpack all of the sort of damage that's happened. And, you know, we've been in a great space, at least for the last five years, you know what I mean? So I, my mother, you know, my early 20s, we've been great, you know what I mean? My father, it's not so much that we've been bad. It's just, we just, we don't, we don't talk, you know what I mean? Like, I, don't, I just don't communicate with him because just who he is as a person, I just, I just don't really, mm, I just don't really mess with like that, you know what I mean? And so all of the things that I had growing up, the anger and the frustration and all, and all of this stuff, in my 20s, I have unpacked it. I have totally gotten over all of those emotional hurdles. And truly, by the time that I was, you know, 27, 28, I, I was light. I was free. I was free of all of that. And now that I have, you know, Lyme disease and I have, you know, my, my life has changed in such a drastic way. You know, it's interesting that the person that I, I was really close to, my mother, it's interesting that she would betray me and that and and i know that's a very like harsh word but that's what it feels like it feels like you, like you betrayed me you know what i mean because all of these years that i've been gone i haven't asked you for shit you know what i mean i've been doing my own thing and now that i'm sick and you have the resources and, and the thing is that like i'm not asking i'm not asking for like thousands of dollars or anything. I'm not asking for money to, to, to do any of that. Like sometimes I'm, I just need like food, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I just need food and everything else I take care of. You know what I mean? All the little bills I have, I take care of those things. And it's just like, for her to just be so adamant on the fact that she's just reluctant to help me is, is it, it sucks, but it is what it is. And my father, in this whole process, he's actually been the one to like lend me this helping hand, which has been just so strange. Cause, like I said, my father and I, we had no, we've had no real relationship ever in my life. Like we've never, ever, ever, just like I could, like I, in many ways, I envy people who are like, oh, you know, my dad. I'm gonna, you know, I call up my dad. Hey, how are you doing? You know, oh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go uh, play you know, play catch with my dad or whatever. I've never had that with my father. And don't get me wrong, like I'm not complaining because people don't even have fathers, but I've never been that person with my father. I could never just call him up to be like, hey, how are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, what's new? Never, 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 never. And so in this whole process for him to actually be the one that has compassion, for him to actually be the one that's in my corner, it's, it's strange, it's surprising, but it just shows me that he really does love me. You know what I mean? He still really does love me. And I guess all of the past things that, that he, just all of the past things that we went through, I know that that has a lot to do with what he's doing now. I think that he has a lot of remorse and regret for um, 
I guess the way that he treated me growing up and just the way that our relationship just sort of deteriorated from a very young age. And so all of that is happening. And, you know, this, this whole like having to be supported by this person or just like just, just having to be a burden on everyone is exactly what I did not want to happen. When I was in New York and, I was, and, and the virus broke out and I had to come back to Miami, I was just like, oh God, I already know what's gonna happen. I already know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna get down there and I'm gonna have to be pretty much just like an open wound, you know what I mean? For everyone to just sort of like patch up and like, like almost like a baby, you know what I mean? I feel very childish and childlike. And it's, it's like I said, it's degrading. You know, it, it, it takes such an, an, it feels like such an attack on you as a person, on your, on your manhood, on everything, you know what I mean? Like, like all of those things are just so, so, so like dehumanizing in so many ways. And, I guess that's just part of the of the nature of the disease, right? You just have to sort of let go. And that's another thing about this whole process is that like I've been fired, I've been, you know, broken up with, I've been let go, I've been I've I've in so many words like I've had to learn to understand that letting go is just one of one of the lessons right now in my life. And you know, the whole situation with my family, it's hurtful, it's painful. But again, I'm not that invested in the drama of it. I'm not that invested in the emotion of it. You know, I'm human, so like, obviously, like, I feel, you know what I mean? I feel things, but it's like, I always have to catch myself. I'm not like a little 16-year-old, you know, angsty teenager that, that wants to get back at my parents or that wants to, you know, like get revenge for making me feel like shit no like it hurts but I have to realize that I cannot do anything about them that's one of the lessons about growing up you know now that I'm you know 30 like one of one of the, the lessons that I've really truly learned and internalized is that you cannot change what another person does you cannot change another person in that way all you can really control is you and yourself and what you do and how you react. And so whenever you're, whenever you're placed in these situations where you're sick and you have to depend on people and you have to call people, can I get a ride? Can I get this? All of these things, they make you feel so small and useless and just, just you feel like nothing. And in the process I've learned that I cannot control what other people do to me. I cannot control that. All I can do is control myself. So another reason why I didn't want to come back to Miami was the simple fact that, you know, New York City has the transit and like, you know, I'm able to, to get on the, the train. And I'm able to I'm able to live with as much autonomy as I can. You know what I mean? And when I'm down here, Literally, you know, it's it's regular America, you know, you have to you need a car A lot of the times I can't even drive a car because a lot of the times I feel like I might you know crash Because I have so much brain fog and I don't trust myself being in a vehicle or driving a vehicle rather and So I, I have to I have to ask this person I have to ask that person and it's just <sighs> Right now I'm doing things to align myself with my next step and hopefully it happens, you know what I mean? But then again, a lot of life right now is faith. And the thing about it is that it's so easy for all of us to complain. It's so easy for all of us to just be like, oh, like, you know, my problem, me, 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 you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, right now, with the state of affairs in the world, everyone is experiencing some sort of setback as a collective. And it's like, I always take into account the bigger picture, like the bigger, bigger picture. I need money for food. Well, there's other people who don't even have a house. Like I have a bed I could sleep in. People don't even have that. There's people on the streets. Like, you know, like I, I see like pictures of the Middle East and I think, I always think about like, man, what if someone in, in, I don't know, what if someone in Iraq, right? I wonder what people in Iraq who have Lyme disease, I wonder what their lives are like. 
I bet it sucks. And many, and many times I bet it's short lived because I bet if, if you live in a society like that, Afghanistan or some, you know, some, some third world country and you don't have access to any sort of even clean, even drinking water, you know what I mean? So I always, always, always try to bring back the fact that it could be so much worse and that I have developed the spiritual resilience to survive this. And as long as I have like that spirit in me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to continue and I'm not going to stop. I feel like I've been through so much in my life, like up to this point. And certainly like the whole Lyme disease has been the worst thing, you know, in my life. But I've been through so many hurdles. I've been through so many ups and downs. And it's just like. It almost feels like this is like my test. You know what I mean? Like my, my ultimate like test. And that's, that's sort of the, the, the mentality that you, not that you have to have, but that's, I've always been a more of like a glass half full than a, gl a glass half empty type of person. So it's like, I try to remain positive. Obviously like external factors, you know, like my mom coming and talking shit to my cousin when she didn't even know I'm listening. You know what I mean? Like those things affect me, but I'm not gonna give my energy to it. I'm not gonna give my energy to that. I'm gonna continue on my path and that's what I have to do. And for all of y'all who have Lyme disease or, or MS or whatever other condition, like you have to develop that inner spiritual core, honestly, because there have been days, there have been weeks when I've been in bed and I cannot get out of bed. And I would be just glued to a bed for weeks and weeks. And in those moments, like you are literally like, what the fuck am I living for? Why am I living right now? What am I alive for? What is my purpose? And everyone is different. Everyone is different. Everyone is going to find whatever purpose they, they serve or they have. But it really, really, really starts from that inner spiritual work and that inner resilience and that inner development, you know what I mean? It's a lesson and, it, and it, it's many lessons. And in this whole process, you know, like I said, I'm really close to my cousin and, and he's been, he's been really just like the, the backbone of my support. And you know, like I, I owe him just so much and Luckily, I have him. And I think about if I if I didn't have him, what would I have done? Like what what? Where would I have been? Like what what would I be doing right now? You know what I mean? And then and it gets dark. Like it gets dark. It gets scary. You know what I mean? You think about suicide. You think about just all of the things in life that that you have yet to accomplish and all of the things in life that you want to do and that has left to be done. You know what I mean? That's like all of the pinnacles that you, you set for yourself to, to hit. And whenever you get this like really chronic, ugly disease and it just sets you back in such an awful manner, you, all of those things feel like a million miles away. All of those things feel like a million miles away. And having these, these chronic diseases, really it, it necessitates having a strong support system. You know what I mean? And, and I've had to like, I've had to go online. I've had to look up support systems and it's not easy. And then adding to the fact that we have this, this worldwide thing going on right now where it's like, you cannot meet in person. So it's like, right now everyone is living in solitude for the most part. Everyone is, is, is they've, they've had to definitely like downsize uh, their social life. And I say that because last year is whenever I got sick. And last year is whenever I had to pretty much do all of those things. So I feel like I have a head start in that department because I was able to, not that I was able to, I was forced to, to be sick and to be alone and, and, to, and to sort of grapple with these emotions and all these things that were happening to me at, at once. And so whenever this happened this year, Obviously it sucks. Obviously I would rather, you know, be talking to someone and be outside and, and all these things. But 
what it grants us is the time. That's what this that's what this whole process has granted us. It has granted us the time to be present with ourselves and to work on ourselves and to work on whatever baggage you have. And only you are responsible for really unpacking those things. That's another thing that I learned. So but with all of that being said, I'm going to continue to have hope. I'm going to continue to have faith. And I'm going to continue having a strong mindset because whenever you have these diseases and these conditions, you need a strong mindset to keep yourself going. And that's all I can pretty much say. So that was it for this video. I'm going to continue with more videos. Um, I really appreciate it if you made it to the end of the video. So yeah, I'll check you later. Bye.